But you're like, actually, what I really wanted to do is I, I'm, I want to make a pottery studio because I've got a gift in like making things. But I love the, the beauty of pottery, but I, it's not going to pay. And so this actually happened in one of our workshops with the Renaissance. This lady, for a long time, she's just in more of her gifting area, even though she wasn't passionate, because it pays the bills, right? It's what I call the practical versus the passionate. Sometimes you just got to do the practical, even though it's not super close to your passionate, right? Later on in life, the practical and the passionate have a much more overlap. And that's a great place to be, right? Um, so I mean, I want to just point to within my world, like. Os Guinness is like someone who has is fully within his passion and his gifting, but it actually helps him sustain too because you know he gets paid decently to speak and so on and so forth. You know, um, but but a lot of us are still working on the practical to get to the passionate. Does that make sense? I would venture to guess that the majority of us will do something that we're decently skilled at, um, and maybe even gifted at, but not uber passionate about, and just be okay with it for some time. Because eventually you do want to get to a spot where you can do the ultra passionate stuff along with your gifted stuff, right? And they become the one and the same thing. Um, it's just a fact of life. I like to alliterate, right? But our, I want to say, generally speaking, our 20s and our 30s are for tilling. <laughs> They're for tilling the ground, keeping the head, our head down, 10,000 hour theory and all that, right? It's just for tilling. Thomas Edison, you know, um, he said, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. We just have to get there. We just have to grind it out for maybe 10, 20 years. Our 20s and our 30s are for tilling. And then as my mentor said, he said, Rich, keep in mind as you head into your 40s, that between 40 and 60 should be your most productive years. And so I like to say our 40s and our 50s are for flourishing. First you till the ground, and then you let the thing bloom and you begin to flourish. So many of us want to get quickly over to flourishing and crushing it and whatever, but we forget that everyone we look at on YouTube or wherever, they've, they've tilled it, right? They've tilled the ground for 10, 15, 20 years, and now they're 40, but all we see is the final cut, and then we go, oh, Michael Phelps, he just swam and it took him 60 seconds. Let me just try to, and you've seen those, you know, those Facebook things where like you were like, you're all inspired and you put on the, you know, swimming cap and you dive and it's like, doesn't look anything like, it. you know what I'm saying? Like expectation reality thing. But like, we're all so quickly getting over to wanting to crush it and flourish, but we forget that 20s and 30s are for tilling, 40s and 50s are for flourishing. And then the, I like to say is 60s and 70s are for sowing, meaning you sow, you're, you're now you mentor. You sow back into the generation who are 20s and 30s. And that's why, by the way, mentoring is so crucially important to everything we're doing here. Um, I actually think you would save a lot of time and heartache if you would stop hanging around with each other. I'm just going to say it like that, right? And then find someone who's 20 years older than you and just like pick their brain and just buy them coffee, you know? Um, and then if it's me, a steak dinner is nice too. No, I'm just kidding. Like find a mentor and hang out with them. Just this weekend, I was hanging out with my great uncle who's 80 years old and I was like soaking it up, you know? Like at your age, I was like, I don't even know who anyone who's 80 years old and they probably smell funny, like whatever, right? Like I'm not trying to, but as I get older, I'm realizing, wait a second, I have so much to learn in advance by these folks um, that, that just a 30 minute you know, conversation is more than like 30 months of like, oh man, what's my calling? You get the idea? So save yourself a lot of heartache and time by figuring out mentorship. Why do I say stop hanging out with, of course, you know, hang out with each other, but your, your buddy who's also 22 and like, you know what I mean, like your peer, oftentimes can't see things in you that a 40 year old can see very well because they're like, wait, I lived that life. And I remember I thought it was this, but it wasn't. And I see you just, you know what I'm saying? Or like, hey, my niece is 30 and she thought blah, blah, blah. And I see you, her in you or whatever. And I can tell you, I can save you some time. Let's redirect. So your mentors can give you some wisdom. And so Christian community is not supposed to be just horizontal. It's supposed to be vertical too, if that makes sense. So that you gotta have these people speaking in. Yeah, Josh. So when you were just describing like how most of us- Yeah, that's a good question. Problem that you see. Uh, <laughs> The short answer is we live in a fallen world, so things aren't ideal. Therefore, the Apostle Paul had to literally make tents. Does that make sense? Like if there was an apostle firm hiring, like he would be the first, you know what I'm saying? Like that, that's great. He'd be paid for being an apostle, and so he didn't have to make tents. But a lot of us will have to make tents, and that'll be our day job literally for 10, 20 years. 
But who knows, maybe as a result of carefully discerning, listening prayer, which we'll do here just a bit, mentorship, and some of this content, maybe you'll get there sooner rather than later. And so, does that make sense? You'll be able to get closer to the central part rather than having to wait 20 years to figure out, oh, that's what I'm also quite gifted and passionate about. I can get there earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, okay, the educational choices. Okay, good. Yes, yes. Um, the answer is this, and again, I lean on my mentor a lot, and this is, I'm just trying to embody for you guys why mentorship is so important. Oz Guinness was in our podcast interview, and they asked him, give us your most profound piece you, know, you can on, on calling. And he says, let's just be very practical, he says, right? Um, he says, why don't we talk to people about calling, not when they're 26, went to college, finished grad school, and now, like, what do I do with my life? Why don't we talk to them when they're 16, so that they can find a college that fits their calling, pick their major accordingly, and then find a career that fits in line with all of that. So the short answer is, we should have created this course four years ago. For all, you know what I'm saying? Like That's the short answer. I do think, we, you're right, educationally, we need to have that conversation earlier on. So at least we're here at a university context where we can still have the conversation before you're launched out into grad school or a work, or a job, or whatever, right? But the answer to your question is, yeah, I think the educational system generally has set, it up, set us up more oriented around, like, here are a set of skills that you need to master, and then therefore end the SAT, and then go to college, versus, like, what are you made to be or do, and why are you made the way you are? and then decide to either go to art school or go to a liberal arts or you know x y and z based on earlier engagement you see the statistic a lot basically 80 percent of american workers either are dissatisfied at their job or downright hate their job that's 80 percent right and three two out of every three american grads college grads are working in a field completely unrelated to their major Right? So 67% are like, why did I go to college? And then 80% are like, why am I at this job? <laughs> and so our, our hope is to reverse those statistics by trying to discern calling sooner rather than later. Good. EG. I just had a quick question going off of things. Yeah. Um, I get what you <laughs> It's tough, I think, <laughs> because we live in the world that we do and we have to make tents. Maybe that's tent making for them for a while while they're quote unquote side hustle, right? I mean, to use an odd term within a Christian university context, but their hustle might be, right? Like it might be like, I've got to do things to eventually make a sliding scale where I can work myself out of this pay, it pays well to this is my passion and now I can live fully alive for Christ. There's a sliding scale and you got to be thoughtful and mentors can help with that and so forth. But I will, I will take, I will take your point um, as as well received because um, I think again the ideal is you've got life is too short for us to for us to live somebody else's version of calling, right? We've got to find what God has made us to do and be, and figure out our why so that we will be fully alive. I mean, I was thinking about um, sports medicine when I was in college, right? And I was semi-passionate about it because I was like, oh, I get to work with the Lakers or something like that. <laughs> um, I really, that was like kind of my motivation. But um, I was, <laughs> it was the opposite. I was passionate about it, but I didn't have much gifting. How do I know? Because I got a bad grade in chemistry and physics. And you know, what I'm saying? <laughs> I figured it out quite quickly. So sometimes we're on the gifted side, but no passion. Sometimes we're on the all passion, but no gift, right? So again, ideally, the world is blessed most and you are at your calling, and God is glorified most when those come together, right? But yeah, your question is a, is a, is a very good one, and it's something that is like, it really takes the ins and outs of knowing your life, and yeah, how long can you bear it, and those types of things. But again, this is an ideal. Any other questions? Okay, Ellie. So Celeste Headley, let's go back to that TED Talk, right? Celeste Headley says, I'm an NPR radio broadcaster and an opera singer. Those are very different ones. But her mission, her why, is to inspire and mobilize people by the power of her voice. She's figured out her why. 
Now the what's can be multiple and vary. Her opera singer is probably, here we go, a little bit more like her passion and her gift, but doesn't pay very well. Her NPR broadcasting work probably pays pretty well, even though she may not be as uber passionate about it. So, so there's going to be different what's that we can do our best to tent make with. And you get the idea, like we have to juggle those so we can make it work. But the ideal is you all are always living out your why. Sometimes it pays less, so you've got to find something else that pays more, and you can make it sustainable. But the key is don't be a radio broadcaster or don't be an opera singer. Figure out why you want to inspire people by the power of your voice. Figure out what your why is, and then your what's will be a lot more discernible, right? So again, my thing is to bridge the church and the academy with theology. And they're like, hey, we'll pay you a lot. I won't do it because it's not within my why. Right? So it's easy to, for me to reject or accept speaking engagements based on my why, right? every time. Uh, I'll give you one last story. My, uh, again, it was with Oz. We were in Oxford. I was heading back my last lunch with him. He took me out. He was like, Rich, as you head back to Orange County, you're going to graduate with your doctorate. You're going to have a lot of opportunities coming your way. right?" And I was like, mm, I'm getting a DPhil in theology. I don't think I'm going to have a lot of opportunities coming right, right, right? But he goes, as you have these opportunities come, he said this, and I don't think I'll ever forget. He said, be sure to be able to say no to the ones that aren't central to your calling, your why. But once you have your why, you can quickly discern whether these things are central or not. And so sure enough, actually, within a few months, I was offered a different couple different jobs as a pastor, actually, to join a few churches. But my, I believe my work is to bridge the church and the academy, not to be a senior pa or not to be on a pastoral staff per se. Does that make sense? I want to do the bridging work. I want to stay one foot in the church, one foot in the academy, bring good theological thinking into the church, and you get the idea, right? So I need to play that middle space, and that's why when I, when I heard Oz's voice in my mind, I thought these are great. And, and by the way, financially, it could have very much helped my situation a lot right, right after my doctorate, right? I was in a pretty tough financial situation, but I did my best as I could to resist any opportunities, even those good ones of being a pastor, right? Because it wasn't central to my why. But the only way you're going to be able to do that wisely is if you know your why, right? That's crucial. Um, when you drive around town and you see a Wahoo, so when I, I actually ran a clothing business too, and then whenever I see someone wearing my shirt, I was like, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, you know? So I was going to ask you, like, yeah, how does that feel? And then, like, how do you, like, not let it get to your head, you know? So, because that's an amazing feeling, absolutely. You know? So, yeah. the best feeling I've had about Wahoos was, you know, I went to, J I went to Japan to see the Wahoos in Japan, huh. and I flew out there, and I'm waiting in line like everybody else. And, uh -huh. and, and now you see your menu being ordered in a different language, mm -hmm. uh, it's just mind blowing. Like, yeah. It's like you're hearing this the Japanese, I'll like, number two, and you're yeah. like, oh, dude, this is so awesome. You, <laughs> yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. you go up there, and, and the kids are want to take pictures with you, you're yeah, like, dude, yeah. this is so awesome. And, and the reason why it has not gotten in my head, I, actually it's an embarrassing story, is because there was a point, point in my life where I thought it was like, all my friends got in my mind, like, dude, you're the wildest guy. You can't be driving a Ford Ranger. You can't be doing this. You can't. The huh. wildest guy should be driving a nice car. Sure, yeah. And, you know, I said, you're right. So I huh. bought myself a bit of nice, expensive car. Yeah, yeah. And, and I made a fool out of myself because I went to a winery. I actually I wanted to buy an expensive bottle of wine. I can, I can, you know, I, I, I said, hey, this thing is so stuck in my head because I go, do you know who I am? I actually said those words oh like, out loud to this guy. It was, give me that bottle and a case of that and yeah, 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 yeah. I can do this. And then the guy, they gave me my bill and I went, oh, oh my God, what have I done? You know, now I have to go out to the car and explain to my wife, what would you do? And I'm like, well, you know, he wasn't going to sell me that bottle. So I actually bought another case. And now, and she's like, oh my God. And she's like, Go back in there and apologize, and you're nobody. You go, oh, and wow. you're like, oh, and went in there and apologized. Wow. And that was so cool. He goes, Give me the, bring the wine back inside. We'll ship it to your house, and why don't you drink this tonight? And I'm right, like, I'm right. really sorry. I apologize. Then, you know, one time I'm drinking, uh, with, uh, having a cocktail with friends, and I'm trying to show off again, and they're like, dude, you're the same idiot from high school. <laughs> you don't have to. So those, yeah. when you have good friends that tell you the truth, yeah. or family members yeah, that tell you the truth, you're to, you're always going to be wrong. There's yeah. going to be little moments where you get away and you think you're so cool, but then they bring you right back. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yo, 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 yeah, come yeah. back, yo, yeah. yo, come yeah. back here. Yeah. Come to reality. So 
I, I'm totally blessed. I have an amazing family and, and structure and amazing friends that keep me grounded. Wow, praise God for that. Yeah, that's cool. God.